Hey, welcome to Meyer Details. I'm Nick. And I'm James. And I'm also Nick. Hey, what's up? <laughs> we are excited to have Nick Bentel on the podcast today. And Nick Bentel is a designer and artist. Um, we actually mentioned him on one of the last podcasts. Yeah. We tagged him in an Instagram post and he hit us up. He's like, yo, I'm in the city. Let's hang. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, I... Um, uh, I followed you guys and looked at all your work multiple times, and I was just um, blown away that this podcast is exactly what I need on the train every morning. So I was like, "This is I need to need to uh, talk to these guys." We appreciate that. I mean, I I think this is the first time that we've shouted out someone, and then later interview. I, we haven't we haven't interviewed anyone else that we've shouted out so far. Do we shout out Knack Design? Well, Nick, you're gonna... just going to find discrepancies in the in what I'm saying. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. All podcast. <laughs> no, this is great though. We're really ha- excited to have you on the podcast, Nick. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming in. And you're in the city, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I live in Queens, Astoria, and I um, have a small studio at uh, New Inc., which is the New Museum's art and design incubator for artists and designers. Okay. Uh, first of all, can Let's just get this out of out of the room here. Are you a designer or an artist? Oh, um, uh, I don't really know. I think, uh, like we talked about before, I think the um, artists really say, well, when I talk to people about my art and design practice, artists are like, oh, he's just a designer. Don't worry about him. We don't need to talk about him. And then designers always say, oh, he's just an artist. We definitely don't need to worry about him. Don't worry. So it's... Um, I, I wish they were more together, but I try to label myself as an artist and designer. Okay. Yeah. okay. You're, you're welcome here, Nick. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> we're not going to leave you out in the rain like those other artists and designers. I don't know. Who are these people? They're so dismissive. <laughs> <sighs> I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, maybe, you know, we always like to do like a little Cliff Notes history. Um, get us get everybody caught up to present day. So maybe tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, um, so I am from New York. I uh, grew up in Long Island, Queens. Uh, I went to school at the RISD and Brown Jewelry Program. So mm. it's a five-year program where I studied industrial design at RISD and modern culture and media at Brown. Mm. Um, that really did a lot for what I do now, which is I do a lot of product design stuff, but they're more storytelling objects. Right. Um, objects that have some sort of meaning behind them that maybe are not so uh, in tune with being manufactured a billion times, but have something to say, something that uh, is more about uh, uh, discovering something about the manufacturing process, discovering something about the underlying culture of where they come from or Mm. how they will be used or what their end of life goal is, like how they... uh, uh, how they're disintegrated. Um, right. Then I have a couple other ridiculous projects. Um, but after school, I um, did the freelance thing for a while um, and then ended up at the New Museum, which in the New Inc. Uh, design and art program. Cool. And I, I think I read that your parents are, are they both architects? Or? Oh, yeah, yeah. So I grew up in a, an artist and slash architect household. Uh, my parents run a studio called Bentel and Bentel, um, and they do crazy restaurants, museum spaces, uh, uh, and they're amazing. So basically, they work together and um, uh, with my uncle and my aunt, and they run the studio that does crazy architectural things. So I grew up in that. I essentially grew up underneath their drawing desks. Yeah. And I and I think I also read that you didn't have you didn't really have like TV and video games. Those weren't really integral parts of your childhood. <laughs> yeah, I was not so I grew up in a, like a Waldorf school education, so we were not allowed to have TV, we were not allowed to have any video games or anything, uh, which was great. There Whoa. were Really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, there were a couple um, downsides to this. One is that anytime someone has a SpongeBob reference or any video game <laughs> reference, I like don't get it at all, and I just have to just be left out. So I feel like I lost a little bit of like my like childhood culture, but at the same time, like I got to play outside, um, uh, got to do crazy other things. 
um, that uh, kids just watching TV and video games uh, didn't experience. So it's definitely, uh, there's a pluses and minuses. Right. Would you say, I mean, I, in viewing your work, there seems to be, there's a lot of like playful qualities to the work. And I, and I just like wonder, you know, if that comes from that kind of, like the way that you were brought up and the way that you view creativity as being like, you know, something that you're engaging with physically. And I, I don't know, uh, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah. I mean, the best way to test it out, if there was in the exact copy of me and did the complete opposite, <laughs> of education, that's impossible. We need a control Nick. Yeah, yeah exactly. I do have a twin, uh, <laughs> but uh, she equally does crazy uh object design stuff, um, and... Uh, Wait, so your whole family is artists? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I, I'll just give you the general theme of everything. So my uh, uh, grandparents were both architects, Whoa. and my uh, parents are both architects, and they work together. And then I have a brother who runs a creative studio, uh, also uh, in the New Museum incubator space, and a sister who uh, does food design, crazy food design mm. stuff. So um, You run the gamut of art people in your family like, yeah that's crazy yeah art yeah <laughs> it's it's super fun it's super fun so i'm, yeah. I'm happy that it so ha- have has your whole family collabed on a project no i that would end in complete disaster <laughs> <laughs> um i think everyone has their own personal identity of their the, mm, the okay. theme that people like to do For sure. um and uh i think we just all become we would just revert to us being chi- children again. Mm. Uh, but, I mean, it would be like a 10-person project, which would be really cool. I think I think at some point that should happen. But we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Yeah. Well, you did bring something. That, that's a collaboration with your brother, right? Oh, with yeah. The, so the glasses? For the people who cannot see this visually, uh, I brought two things. There's one, there's these gl- small glasses that I've been making with my brother, um, there, uh, to get into the small glasses trend, we designed, uh, we, we designed small objects and do a performative thing around them, whether that's a, uh, video, music, um, uh, 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 small prod- product thing. So this one was a series of small glasses that are super ridiculous and all you cut, you almost cannot even look out of them. <laughs> yeah. They're, they, they're like neon acrylic and it's like squiggly lines, like but, think but if I, you had like a, a wavy line on your on your. But what I love I love about the squiggle is that it's it's like derived from the it seems to be derived from the bridge of the nose, right. like to have to rest there. There's a perfect squiggle in the center, and that it just you know it the pattern continues. Oh yeah, yeah. that that was that was where we started, yeah. and then we're like, what if you had six noses? <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, these are not for sale as of yet, but we'll be, hopefully we're going to do a small launch for them, uh, in about a month or two. How, how are you launching these? Are these on Kickstarter? Or? Uh, no. So what, what I, I've been doing, which is pretty, has been relatively successful so far is I, uh, you make an object, um, that is, you, you, as a product and you find the manufacturing, you understand how they'll be made. And then you, what I try to focus on is the storytelling aspect of that. Mm. So whether that is uh, a product that has a um, video story attached to it, a audio story attached to it, a crazy photo shoot attached to it, and then hopefully from that piece of media, um, you can create some sort of buzz around that object and then um, uh, that is its mechanism to get out in the world. I I love Kickstarter and I love all these things, but uh, I've always tried to just do it just from zero to a hundred. So, mm. so you're gonna make these just a hundred of them by hand, or get a factory to do them, and then just sell them on your website? Uh, yeah, we have a website going up, and then there's a hopefully small video. But there's, um, uh, yeah, there's like a it's the website itself is the performance, and they're also so ridiculous that <laughs> hopefully people will see the value in these things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I I guess. Uh, you know, to backtrack just a little bit, I mean, you, you have a, a family of architects. How did you then find industrial design? Was it was it through them or was it through school or? Yeah, um, industrial design, I guess, came out of definitely through them. I, I feel like after going to their office basically every day of my mm-hmm. life, I realized that um, architecture is definitely an amazing thing. 
but I wanted to make something more uh, connected to specific cultural moments. If you're making a uh, piece of architecture, it's going to take five years at most. Right, so right. you can't speak on specific issues that are happening to the day to day. Products, yes, they also definitely take years to develop one single thing. However, you can make a statement using an object quickly yeah. and uh, almost like sculptures. Uh, so that's how I see product design, less of a thing that I'm going to sell a million of these small things, but right. like a um, uh, what is the story behind that thing so right. storytelling and statements were they they always a part of your interest in product yeah yeah i guess um so going back to the my my college experience um and at RISD, i studied industrial design it was a great experience was able to do crazy really amazing things but at brown i was able to study modern culture and media and it was basically how to um talk about uh, a media event how to disseminate a media event, how to um, understand what the uh, things that come and go in uh, media, whether it's TV, books, um, radio, uh, movies. So uh, it, that with those two things together, you kind of get this crazy education about like objects and what their uh, devices of um, uh, production are in the terms of getting the visual out there and getting mm. the story of it out there. Mm -hmm. Now, since you you said, you know, you didn't really grow up with TV or video games, but then you're going into media and culture. Was there was there a culture shock? Was there? Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> uh, I've, I completely. Um, uh, I mean, they, they didn't. It wasn't. It wasn't. My parents did not bring me up in an education that was devoid of all uh, like contact with the outside right, world. Right, right, right. But, uh, but you weren't in the Shire. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but uh, um, <laughs> uh, I remember my first couple of high school years being like, "Wow, this is." I I went to a Walter school at the beginning, and then went to a, a school that had a lot more people in high school, and uh, there were 400 kids in a grade, mm. and to me that was massive. Yeah. Um. So I was just so so shocked that there could be so many people doing the same thing. They were doing it as everyone was at their top-notch level. So right. in a school of 20, you're like, you could easily um, perform well, whereas a school of 400, that's not so much. And then you have so many ideas going around with 400 people and uh, so many different concepts and people coming from so many different uh, backgrounds. So um, I there were specific moments that that happened. Yeah. Um, I, do you play video games now? I do play video games. Okay. Now. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, actually, uh, a couple old school video games. So I was allowed to play uh, Warcraft Three as a little kid. Oh, um, thank God! That I, game is so good. I don't know that one. It was in like 2003. It was created, but um, my. Uh, quite a few of my friends who are uh, in the creative field who were maybe brought up in a similar way all loved this game because you could play it as a land party right. and bring back that experience. Oh, I've recently done oh, that, man. which is great. Oh man. oh man, Blizzard, you know Blizzard Studios just does amazing work. Warcraft, Diablo. Did you play those games? I played Diablo two. I was a big Diablo two player, but I, I did was play a Warcraft three. I was which a Minecraft was... boy. Oh. Minecraft. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we were we were in war crafting. You were in the mines. Oh, okay. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, what year did you graduate uh, college? Uh, two thousand sixteen. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So um, so yeah, I oh, mean, you you said you freelanced straight out of college. Mm. Yeah, yeah. So I like the last year was kind of like not that much. So it was a five year program. So I was kind of out in the the year before that. Um, Wait, it was RISD was a five year program. No, RISD and Brown, the dual degree program. So, oh, the dual degree. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so um, uh, to do both degrees, you have to stay there for five years, um, and uh, then yeah, then right after that, I was just immediately got into like I'm gonna conquer the world. So okay, and and then you decided to just start your up your own thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, that that is true. I so there were. There's this gap here, Nick. I'm just trying. To... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, people <laughs> so, are interested in this gap. Okay, so there Jesus is. Jesus a... was a baby, and then he was the Messiah. So where's yeah, yeah. What's the in between? Okay, so there is. I, there's a very funny story that uh, solves this problem. So the my senior year, my 
super senior year and my senior year and junior year of college, I started a fake studio because mm. I was like, I'm done with school. I don't want to do this. There's this crazy uh, stereotyping of students making student work. Um, and his name was Nicholas Gregory. So quite a few of my projects are labeled Nicholas Gregory. Hmm. And they did extremely well online. And I was like, wow, this is amazing. I'm Nicholas Gregory now. <laughs> and because of that, I was... Is, wait, is Gregory your middle name? Uh, Gregory is my middle name. Okay. But okay. all my... So I had a studio page and made fake studio photos. Um, and uh, it worked out really well. I was invited to Milan Design Week to show my furniture collection there. Wow. Fully paid for. I had a... Uh, I had a couple other ridiculous things that are not on my website at the moment that happened. Um, uh, but uh, because I took off the student label, um, uh, people looked at the work as as uh, uh, what you would consider uh, like a normal human. So oh, that's right. interesting. Yeah. Wait, so is any of that work still up there? Yeah, up I mean, if you line? look up, if you look up Nigger's Gregor, you'll find I'm gonna do that right quite now. a few projects. Oh man, well. Um, I so the first time I was ever familiar with your work, Nick, I saw the stool with the glue bucket, the glue bucket stool it's spelled with a K. Oh yeah. Um. Oh yes, the glue bucket stool. So, so I, I yeah I I want to hear this story because when I saw this thing, it was it, it just was a beautiful and amazing design, and I was just shocked by like the the seamless the seamless way you integrated into the manufacturing process. Can you tell that story? Uh, yeah, yeah. So that started out as kind of an exploration in materials. I was not intending to make a stool. Um, uh, so, and I think that's the beauty of the project. It's it's more about the um, the the capabilities of ma- the material. Right. Uh, to... And it, it's a bunch of paper, right? It's, it's like a bunch a of paper. A bunch yeah. of paper strips, and then it's just glued all together at the top. Yeah, yeah, that's... that's but it's not made that way. Um, well, it's... Yeah, so it's not made that way. So basically how the whole... Uh, it, this was a test in, like, manufacturing and how things come together. And the stool is made by um, cutting excess strips, using the excess strips of paper, whether that is a uh, from a uh, book-making manufacturer or a paper-making manufacturer. Mm. They'll dump the extra strips in a bucket filled with a little bit of this glue that will uh, um, stay soft for about 24 hours. And then when it hardens, they'll flip the bucket over and pop the bucket top off and a stool will have been born. And it and it and the whole idea was that if this could hold let's say 250 pounds to 200 pounds, it could be a traditional stool and the garbage of this process would end up making a product. Yeah. So there's like no extra work going into making this product. This product is already made, but no one has ever just dumped glue into it. Like yeah. that, that was the only new ingredient. Yeah. Now, did you actually get, like, did you actually talk to a book manufacturer or is this more conceptual? It's more conceptual. I did one small run mm-hmm. uh, and I still have quite a few of these uh, left over from it. Um, but I did it with a book manufacturer that makes children's books. So children's books are made, there's certain ones that are just ginormous. You have like 17 inch right. long yeah, yeah. books. So that was perfect. The stool, traditional stool is 17 inches tall. Right. Uh, so we, they ended up cutting most of their garbage scraps, um, and, uh, made quite a few stools out of it. That's cool. That's awesome. Um, yeah, and you've worked on some other projects. I know an, another recent project you work working on is this chalk thing. Yeah, yeah. So I, I brought one of them in. Um, it they're uh, coming back from my parents being architects uh, and growing up in this architectural environment. Uh, they're chalk toys that make architectural drawing uh, lines. So there are three different types. Now there's a fourth one, but you can draw circles, lines, and dots using these. Um, and basically. They uh, completely made out of chalk. Oh, so so nice. So these this you know you hear this right now and you're like oh chalk. Some Nick just made chalk like cool cool thing. <laughs> but you see them in real life and they're like this one kind of looks like a honeycomb or like a pyramid. It's like revolved with a bunch of flat discs. But the fun thing is is that since it's a pyramid shape, you can rotate it around and make these really cool lines. Um, yeah, one of the, one of the things that I that I love about it, just in watching the videos of it being used, is like how w- with this one in particular, how like your fingers can kind of rest <laughs> in those spaces. It just looked really satisfying 
to like hold. I, what I'm curious about is I've I've been in the position where I've I've like designed something and then I've handed it to like a prototype to a kid and they have it's like they have one of those things from Dragon Ball Z where they just like zoom in on like the weakness of something <laughs> and they just immediately start breaking it. And and I'm curious, especially with this one, like did you have any experiences where they would like disassemble your did, yeah, talk. did you have to test like the f- the fragility of it? Yeah, so uh, during I had a photo shoot with uh, a photographer friend of mine, Minu, and uh, he did an amazing job. And it it was just we had four children come in and with varying ages, and yeah. uh, one of the children was they're all so cute, and basically she ended up just throwing she destroyed twenty of these easily. <laughs> so she basically. Chalky just was to move across the surface. Right. She threw them. And then <laughs> once she realized that she could throw them and get away with doing it without, like, us, her parents weren't around. Yeah. So I was like, oh, the, the floodgates have been released. She is going to destroy <laughs> Well, you did make a ball. Oh, yeah. That one she, she <laughs> tossed. And they are projectiles if a little kid has them. But they, uh, what I've been, I, after testing them multiple times, they, four or five is definitely the age range where they can start Using them, right. uh, I don't think kids who are four and three that understand a drawing tool as much. They will just play with it in a crazy manner. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I kids are great because they also, as adults, these are, they hold well in your hand. And, but as kids, they're just, they're relatively large, so they can just create huge shapes very quickly. Yeah. Because cause especially with this one, I could imagine, like, somebody, like, snapping them off, like, like it's uh, okay. Like I've drawn all this one. Now I'm gonna snap off the next one or do I don't know. It's just like that seems like a nice. That seems like another product idea. Yeah. Oh is, yeah. Is yeah. there like yeah? I, I guess um, you know you you said there was the one person, the one kid who threw them. But were there any other unexpected uses? Oh yeah yeah. Um, the I really I have a few illustrator friends who have done some pieces with these mm. and um they'll cut off specific ones that they don't need for a drawing uh the classic use case is um musician so mm. uh when you're studying in your in music school many times you'll go for your um uh musicianship class and that's usually on a uh, chalkboard and I have mm. quite a few musician friends and uh to draw five lines very quickly yeah. is really and in a in a clean way is very hard. So this actually helps out them very. It, it was a it was a kill two birds with one stone situation. Were, were you inspired by that originally to create the chalk? Uh, like slight, what was your original inspiration for these crazy shapes? Yeah, um, that was definitely. I definitely had thought that would have been an outcome. I didn't realize how excited they would be about it. Uh, they're extremely excited. It, it really uh, it, it saves them so much time when they're drawing on chalkboards with quick um, music notes. Um, uh, the reason why I made them was <clears throat> I wanted to re-envision how chalk being a very simple material that's been around for thousands of years, can I um, redesign it that would be unique and original, but also change the way we draw and consider drawing and our tools for drawing. Right. I like that. I, now, Nick, You've made these production? Are these they're in they're in production and they're being sold. manufactured? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so you connected with a manufacturer in China or uh, no, no? Or where? This is a very fun story. Mm-hmm. So um, I tried to make everything locally or based in the U.S. Um, and I um, I recently did a Kickstarter for this. So I, I had a done most of the factor most of the manufacturing was done in a studio out in Long Island City, uh, Sculpture House Casting. They've done a great job. Um, and how did you find them? You just searched. People who make chalk? Yeah, well, no, people who cast. So uh, this company does everything from bronze to wax to uh, plaster it. casting. So they were a really good fit. Okay. Um, uh, no, wait, wait. Is, is chalk plaster? Or am I going it's, crazy? It's, a, it, it's made in the same way. It's, okay. a, it's basically softer plaster. Got it. Um, plaster is just a little too hard to okay. do that. Uh, uh, but I needed someone who could just do a little bit more. Um, so I uh, did a Kickstarter because I wanted to raise some funds for some new molds. And uh, that did very well. And uh, I reached out to places in China. But you need to get 
like 30,000 pieces right. of chalk to do yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. And I'm not interested in in managing 30,000 pieces of chalk. I, somewhere in between. Right. Um, and it, it was doing extremely well. It's uh, sold in quite a few museum shops and stores around the city in the U.S. And um, I reached out online and there is a woman came back to me and said, I cannot make this for you, but I know an Amish community in um, uh, the Midwest that would love to manufacture chalk for you. So, uh, so I'm going huh. to this Amish community to uh, 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 basically set this whole thing up. I've been in contact with them, and they're extremely excited. Uh, so, yeah, it's it's uh, made in the U.S. still. That's cool. Great. That's interesting. I did not know that they would make chalk like that. I guess there's all kinds of different manufacturing. Uh, yeah. No, I mean, it, it's so interesting to me that, <laughs> that you're using. I mean, I, I grew up in like kind of next to Amish country. <laughs> and it's it's kind of interesting given your your other project, which I mean, you know, the the whole like human chair or human furniture thing and just like bringing it down to, you know, that level where it's like back to basics. I mean, you know, the Amish famously don't use electricity. They're using a lot of like hand tools and things like that. Like, are you excited to visit that oh, operation? I'm, I'm so excited. It's uh, the, the great thing about these are they're very simple. They look complicated, but there's uh, to get the cost down to make a reasonable price at the end of the day. Uh, each one needs to be a two-part mold, um, and uh, there are definitely ways around it, but I had to sacrifice a lot of the, my original designs mm. to manage that. Um, but it's you could explain how these are made in 20 minutes to someone, and um, it's, it's a very simple process. So um, I, I love making things that are simple but original. Yeah. yeah. Now, wait, you mentioned the human chair project. Nick, I want to hear a little bit about this. You, you're just, you're becoming furniture as a human? Oh, yeah. Uh, so I have a video series uh, out on YouTube, which is progressively getting crazier and crazier, where um, I try to push the boundaries of product design, uh, whether that is trying to become products or um, trying to redesign or, or uh, reconsider the manufacturing uh, that happens in product design. So a uh, few examples. I go all the way to try to patent my actual human body as human furniture. So I designed myself into... Um, no, pieces. wait a yeah. second. Can, can we just, for a second, <laughs> you, said, you said you designed yourself. Nick, you're just standing there naked. <laughs> On, on the ground, like as a coffee table, is that design? That, yeah, that is a great question. Or is that art? <laughs> that this is, is a this really is the conundrum. Good, this is yeah. the conundrum. I don't know. I, I think it's design because you're manipulating objects in space, right? But it, but it's isn't that isn't that no, design? No, it's yoga. Wow, oh, yoga. Yeah, it but is, isn't it is. yoga a type of like you're designing your body into a certain position? I would call yoga an art form, not a design project. Hmm. I continue though. I, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, not not like putting it on blast. I'm no, just... no, no. I I think that's that is the question that is un, you cannot an, no one can answer that question, and that's what this specific video plays with. So, in one of the episodes of the series, I go from uh, designing myself as furniture, making the design plans for it, submitting it to the U.S. Patent Office, um, getting my patent pending. Um, uh, certificate and talking to lawyers about this and specifically patent lawyers to get through the whole process. Uh, so it's, if you want to learn how to patent something in the most ridiculous way, this is definitely the video for you. Did, did you actually get a patent on your body? It's, uh, it's currently pending. Pen so, well, yeah. is it a so it's a design patent or a utility patent? It's a, it's, it's a, um, it's not a design patent. It's the utility patent. Okay. Yeah. So it's it's pending though, so it hasn't yeah. been approved. It it has been approved, but the fact that they were like, okay, here's your pending certificate. Yeah. And they gave me a number and an, and a um a um a time and place, like basically the whole the whole right. nine yards. Right. So it was that that is insane. Well, <laughs> it came in the mail. It was just yeah. I so we are in, we yeah. are currently interviewing a physical patent pending. Yeah, I guess that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I've never interviewed a patent before. So this is a new experience for me. I don't know about you, Nick. That's new for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the other project that you engaged in was uh, making 
a wooden stool with with nothing but using your your body as like the tool to make the stool. Yeah, so th- this one of this video in the series uh, was creating a stool completely from scratch without using any tools. Um, and that was from starting in the woods to figure out how to get a tree out of the woods and back into a, a shop where you could figure out how to manage this. I ended up talking to a couple woodworkers, including my father, who was very uh, excited and happy to do this project with me. <laughs> uh, and uh, basically, I ended up gnawing and chewing and scratching at this pieces of wood that I collected uh, for quite a while until they came into this general shape of a stool. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, it, it it worked. It was a thing. Um, it's definitely rickety, but uh, it... Uh, uh, if you wanted a stool, I would say here's here's a stool that I made with my teeth. <laughs> I okay. Tell me the truth. Did you use any tools? I I did not use any tools. Uh, it definitely it's. Uh, I can't, I, can't, I cannot believe this project. This sounds crazy to me. It's um, how did you do the flat toppies? So that was uh basically in the beginning of the video. I like cut down this huge ginormous tree, and that yeah. It, there's some movie you, magic what? there where you. Pushed down. You didn't yeah, yeah, yeah. cut down. Well, you pushed it was, down, it, and it was dead. Tree. It was dead, though. It was, it was dead. dead. So all this, all this wood is from the Adirondacks, where uh, there are trees that are dead. And I was looking for trees that were kind of foamy. Mm. So I did make quite a few pieces that just completely disintegrated. Mm. So it was like in between. It this video is more of a thought piece than anything else. Obviously, I'm not trying to make furniture for my life that will last a hundred years. But it's more of a if society completely collapsed and uh we all being product designers would we be able to survive without uh having whole foods did and you, did you use IKEA. rocks did you use rocks to as i i did not i did not use rocks i did not use so rocks. just your body yeah just just my body as much as possible so there's a hilarious scene where my father is using my hand as a uh hammer to oh, hammer in so the good. top of the stool um and uh it's it's extremely fun. It it was painful, but I I happy I did it for the for the uh, um, crazy story. Yeah, yeah. I, I went pretty viral. If I can remember, if what I remember. Yeah, yeah it's uh, it's it's hilarious. If you haven't checked it out, we'll definitely link all of these videos in the description of uh, of this video um, or of the you know pod on the website. But uh, but yeah, was it was it as a result of all the pain that you went through for that? Whether you're like, I'm just gonna make myself furniture because this is ridiculous. I'm bleeding out of my mouth. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was like, how can we explore every facet of this crazy thing that we call product design? Right. Um. So uh, the the next video that I'm releasing, which I'm very excited about, is um, I race a robotic arm. So uh, we've gone through the phase of designing. Any, you, if you can design yourself as furniture, you can design anything. Yeah. Uh, st- uh, that was episode one. Episode two is if you could, uh, without the use of a computer or any tool, uh, you can design anything. Uh, and the next one is if you didn't need factories or robot arms to make things, could you do things? So I, I race a robotic arm on an assembly line to uh, uh, make uh, folding gift boxes. So that's going to be very fun. <laughs> Where, wait. So this is the upcoming video. This is the upcoming video. It hasn't been released yet. And did you win? Or No, I didn't. I, I, I mean to say it. I did not win as everyone thinks, uh, as everyone would think. Uh, but the um, the whole process of not winning is extremely hilarious. Did you, um, how did you get connected with a robotic arm in a gift box factory? Um, that was through a friend from RISD, which was very exciting. I mean, they were actually extremely excited to participate, which is yeah. amazing. So you you basically engaged in the tall tale of John Henry versus do you, this. Do you know that one? I I, I don't. Isn't, but that, I'll say isn't yes. that the one where the uh, he's trying to beat the the railroad link? Yeah, thing? he's yeah he's like a a rail. Yeah, he lays rails. He's like you know hammering nails, and he he faces off against the machine, like right. the very new machine, the industrial and revolution. He, he dies in the process. Yeah. Uh, but, he but, be- yeah, but he beats it. But he beats the I machine. I think he does beat the machine. But he dies. <laughs> but he's. But it's it's like a, an American tall tale. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. I. I. <laughs> I. I. Uh, that I. I feel very humbled with that uh, example. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
But I, I'm I'm curious, like this this whole thing, was there a specific moment that sparked this exploration or you know, or is this something that you've always wanted to do that that now is the right time? How did this all come about? Um I guess it is definitely a reaction towards how I make things or how people wanted me to make things. There's mm. there's a definitely a stereotype of product designers that they do step one, step two, step three, step four mm. in a specific manner. Uh, but there are a lot of ways to design things um, right. and, uh, and a lot of ways to think about how objects are made and handled and used. Um, so it was a reaction out of that that I hope I could answer some of these questions, mm. which is none of these questions are answerable uh, in some times, uh, some practice, like how um, – should we be concerned about robotic arms or should we uh, make stools without, like what does a tool mean and is the mm. tool useful at the end of the day? Um, uh, there are open-ended questions and I think that's where I ended up going towards was these questions that we will be asking ourselves for a hundred more years mm. and um, uh, maybe trying to ask more questions than answer anything. Yeah. Yeah, I saw in the, I guess it was the first video, uh, was it the head of the program at RISD? Um, yeah, so uh, Charlie Cannon, who's a great friend, he um, <clears throat> was uh, talking about uh, the medium is the massage, which is um, a book about uh, how the, the message is more important than the actual content of the message, uh, meaning that um, the famous example is, uh, if you read stuff out of a book, whether you read stuff out of a TV, or you watch stuff out of a TV, the, the, the TV and book as being the medium of those messages are extremely more important for uh, culture and the progression of culture than the actual message, whether that is like watching a cartoon or uh, watching your t- uh, the news every morning. Right. And, and there, he, there's a lot more to that. Yeah. Well, so I don't want to. I, I, and correct me if I'm remembering this wrong. There was something about sort of like getting down to that level of like sympathizing with the tools, with the products, with the process that was like a part of this whole this whole project. Is that is that right? Like just like, you know, getting back to that bare bones of of uh, of product and process. Oh, yeah. yeah like, um, uh the famous example is uh, all product designers and everyone uses a computer. Obviously, it's this fa- this amazing machine that can do so many things very quickly. Uh, but using a computer, you kind of lose sight of uh, why you're doing anything sometimes. Mm. Um, and uh, I think the chalk toys are a great example. Is like architectural drawing tools that bring you down to the basics. You can draw very simple, quick lines. Uh, and um, uh, you you can essentially draw something, but using a very crude method. So the video and all these projects are kind of putting crude back into designing and design thinking and really asking why you want to make something if you're interested in going uh, all the steps to make something. Mm -hmm. That's cool. Do you ever ever think about, like... um... You know, another thing that I think about all the time is like sympathizing with the objects in our life, like they're people, or like they're, like <laughs> you definitely give them like some human qualities. Oh, oh, definitely, definitely. I I love that idea, and it's something that is more and more important as we progress as a culture. Like we obviously, well, in a in a hundred, two hundred years, we're definitely going to have. Product, products that are uh, humanized in some way. Yeah. So that's one aspect of that question. And I think we should have to be very considerate of how we use that type of technology uh, and like humanizing your uh, bed or your piece of furniture or like what if your car has eyes? Uh, like, <laughs> I, like these are ridiculous questions, but they should be talked about even though they're ridiculous because this, this could potentially happen in the next 20 to 100 years. I almost think that adding that human touch to products especially tech and ai is going to be super important like super integral. Right. didn't you see the um the google smart car how they added yeah. eyes to that yeah because everyone is afraid of smart cars so adding that personality to it actually i guess makes it more approachable yeah well it's like yeah like when you're crossing the street and it's like looking at you and seeing you it's right. like it's like it's oh not, i'm safe it's watching me you know? yeah it's like yeah it sees me it recognizes me even, I, uh, even though it's just led display showing 
eyes, you know. I have this I have this winged corkscrew uh at home that I I have lovingly called Buster and and uh this reference might be lost, but this is from Arrested Development. Uh, I think I say Ar- Arthur. No, one of one of the brothers in Arrested Development loses his arm to a seal. <laughs> it's it's actually a comedy. So, but uh but anyway, I've like grown very fond of this wing corkscrew that only has one arm. Like it has a human quality to it. I'm I every time like my wife is like like why haven't we gotten rid of Wait, this? I am so it's, like it's, so sympathetic to it, this wing corkscrew. <laughs> it's broken. It well, it only has one arm, but it's not broken. And it has a great bottle opener on the top of it. And huh. I'm like, he's perfectly functional. So it was designed with one arm? No, he lost an arm. Oh, it, lo- it lost It arm. lost okay. one of the arms, but uh, but perfectly functional. But it's like, that's another thing is like, you know, when we talk about sustainability and disposability, it's like, like if we could design like, you know, things that have that kind of like baby-like gaze, like they look into your eyes, it's like, I can't throw this out. It's so like, cute. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, or uh, like a a blanket of a little kids, or uh, like a little stuffed animal, like stuffed animals. Like I I still have all of mine from when I was really young, and I don't want to do anything with them. You really? Wow. Yeah. Well, I mean, do they're you have stuffed animals. Uh, I think they must be at my parents' place. They might be repurposed for my nephew now. I think mine are gone. I don't know what happened to them. I... <laughs> Your parents Although just I, threw them out as soon as you walked out the door. I do have a lot of dog toys, though. I got a whole box full. Well, are they? You all you designed all of them. Yeah, I, I, I know. I know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, a bucket list thing is I really want to make some dog toys. I'm just like that is a thing. Really? That I just well, before, James and I we we are all we connected. got those hookups. Uh, ah, yeah. nice. nice. <laughs> Um, one of the things that I read about, uh, I think it was in the chalk one, because we've always kind of wanted to dive into like just our personal design philosophies, but it, it sounds like you've kind of been immersed into design theory. And one of the things that you talked about was critical, critical design. Uh, I think it was in reference to the chalk and maybe you could talk more about that. Cause I've never heard that theory before. Mm-mm. Um, uh, I think the chalk is definitely one of my more like playful, um, uh, more uh, mass-produced items, I guess. Mm. But critical design meaning that design should um, question um, something, whether that is your um, uh, how you're using it, how it was created, um, and uh, or how it's being. Uh, thrown away uh mm-hmm. and that could either be a, a dystopic view which is not relatively saleable uh or a <laughs> uh and there's a lot of i do a lot of ridiculous dystopic performative design things that no one would ever want to buy because they're like they just talk about the the scary aspect or the the potential dangers of um uh, approach like a on a environmental social so what, level. Yeah, what, what yeah. would be a good example of like a dystopian product oh um i guess okay one that comes to mind i have this kit that i designed called the ripley kit and it's a kit that you basically to make custom jewelry you can digest a whole bunch of different acids that are are um digestible so lemon juice and certain things and digest a ring blank and your body as a manufacturing object can basically, while it's, everything's churning in your stomach, will disintegrate the gold on the ring to create your own personalized ring. And Just, you will end up pooping it out. And it's it's a beautiful thing. It's about your uh, your um, uh, it's it's a commentary on like the luxury market and commentary on what is personal, what does that really mean? Uh, mm. And this is the most personal ring you'll ever give to your uh, significant other. <laughs> this is this is conce- this is not real, right? This is this is not real, but all the science and all the uh, digestives are completely usable. So uh, it can potentially work. In theory, it could work. Yeah, that's awesome. Okay. I just imagine a proposal. You you show off, you show the ring, and then you're like, "Now, honey, uh, eat it." Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah, I mean, um, so uh, I think another part of the critical design that I was reading about was was that there's a there's a narrative involved in in the creation of things. Um, what's that all about? Um, I guess um, 
I guess there's two sides to this, the narrative of that you want to give to your the, pe- the your viewers, your customers, your people at the end of the day that are going to be using this thing. And that's um, the story the object says and the, the new ideas that hopefully that would be able to be uh, perceived by your customers. So as, for instance, the chalk, if a kid is using it, he might understand that there are unique ways of drawing and there's unique ways of doing things. There's not just the traditional crayola chalk that you can draw one straight line with. You can uh, move things about and you can change um, shapes quite easily and you can, there's diff- different thicknesses of different things. This concept of redesigning chalk is definitely not going to save the world in any respect. Like changing different chalk lengths and uh, widths. However, I think it is, on a small level, it is seeing the world in a different way. Um, And I think that's why I gravitated towards this object. Mm. Do you you intend to to change the world with your design? (laughs) Um, I, I hope so. However, doing more and more product design stuff uh, you are releasing objects into the world. So uh, I always, and doing a lot of client work as well, you always have to just make sure that you're being um, uh, conscious of everything and making it in a, uh, everything should be in a, a conscious manner, whether that's where it comes from and where it ends at the end of the day. Um, doing product stuff, I remember entering in the product design field and being like, oh, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna save the freaking world. Global warming, I got you. <laughs> uh, but it's it's extremely hard. And so I don't, I don't fault a lot of people for um, uh, making objects. However, they definitely need to be highly considered, especially now. Right. Yeah, yeah that's a whole nother conversation. I, I've got some, opinions on that maybe. yeah yeah i mean i think um i i think for you know because we have a lot of students that listen i think that like what you have to consider is that it's probably going to be a very small percentage of people who are i mean there's the there's the whole like you know apple they're they're like that campaign it's like the people who are crazy enough to think that they could change the world did right and it's like if that's your goal if that's what you have in mind like absolutely like pursue that to the degree that you can but it's it's also about the degree to which you can I, and it's like you go into a company you need to make money to live but you can bring those ideas to that company it's amazing what kind of impact or or yeah like impact you can have on like what your product ends up being in the end right i i had the same thing you know i was talking to a bunch of students a couple of weeks ago and, you know, they come up and be like, I'd ask them what they want to do right out of school. And, they're, you know, they want to go work for a really sustainable company and, you know, make life-changing products. And, and again, like, I am all in support of that. But what I'm starting to realize is that it's almost crazy to make that your goal because it's like if you were a firefighter and you were like, hey, I want to be a firefighter, but I want to go work in a place where there's no fires. <laughs> or I want to be a police officer. I want to go work in a place where there's no crime. I want to be a designer. I want to go work in a place where there's nothing that really needs any help to yeah. be designed. Yeah, yeah that, that's, an, that's, 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 that's an interesting point of view. Like, I guess there are ways to, uh, you were talking about, to infiltrate a company that is having interest, uh, practices that probably should be reconsidered and trying to change from the outside in. Yeah. Um, in my practice, I guess, I definitely try to use things that are, like the chalk is from the ground and will end up in the ground and it's literally rock. Uh, So, and it's the packaging is always uh, try to just always do paper stuff. And uh, they um, uh, it's, it's uh, always trying to be a net positive in everything you're doing. And it's, it's definitely, I it's you also in your day to day, you realize how many like little wrappers that you have and all this, plastic stuff yeah, and it's yeah. just amazing yeah. how much you're uh, just because we live in a crazy society that deals with these things and it's already set in stone uh, it's very hard for one person to do anything and I'm always constantly contradicting myself and always trying to uh, change how people are doing things but uh, it, I think it has to happen on a mass scale yeah I mean it's not like we're all like being dumping oil boy, oh, yeah. oil, boy, <laughs> oils into the ocean you know but oh definitely yeah. but I, but i mean you know you are making statements and and the thing about 
uh, like a lot of the projects that I look at and, and the press, there's a lot of press around your, pro around your projects and these statements. And th the thing that I'm curious about is like, are you, are you sending these projects to these different publications or is it a viral thing that they pick up and how's that whole process? Yeah. Um, I do a lot of, at the beginning of doing performative objects, um, is definitely reaching out to a lot of people and figuring out how this whole press cycle works, especially in the design world. Um, and that was a whole whole thing in itself. The design world and design reaching out is uh, very interesting in how that all works. Uh, because you can make it... I've made so many projects that I've tried to contact people for and no one picks them up. So there's so many projects that just have disappeared mm. because of that. So you don't release something that... that people aren't gravitating toward yeah it's a good it's a good test thing mm, uh, that's interesting but mm. uh, I it, it's uh there are a lot of the projects are quite interesting like media campaigns and media stunts I in my art practice I did this uh, race Rachenberg piece which was yeah it was a it was a performance in the art space and it was a performance in um, how uh, Ideas can be translated into actual clicks and actual purchases of the and basically what happened was it was a uh, there's the art world bubble and it's very hard to get into these high ranking auction houses so I ended up creating a auction on my own in a very unique manner. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about that project? It's it's super interesting. Um, yeah. So uh, Robert Rauschenberg is a famous uh, pop artist and in the fifties. He was not famous at all. He was living in New York City, and he went to de Kooning, who's a famous abstract expressionist. And he asked de Kooning if he could erase one of his drawings. And de Kooning luckily said, yes, here's a drawing. Feel free to erase it. Uh, and that drawing right now is hanging up in the SF moment. It's worth millions of dollars. Um, it's, a, and it's a blank piece of paper. It's literally a blank piece of yeah, paper. Yeah. It's very conceptual. Mm -hmm. um, so a couple of years ago, I was like, you know what would be really amazing is if I just wrote a Robert Rauschenberg art piece, but using the method of the time. Um, yeah. And uh, I do a lot of the stuff I do is relatively in the net art world uh, and using the internet as the medium. Um, I wanted to destroy a Robert Rauschenberg art piece. So I have a friend who is a collector and has one. And I came up to him and said, if I raise enough money to purchase this art piece, can I destroy it? And he said, of course. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, uh, the deal was met, and I wanted to raise... The way I was going to raise money to do this was to sell advertising space on the Robert Rauschenberg art piece. So the act of erasure was the act of purchasing. Yeah. And I wasn't directly the person destroying it it was just the art world community coming together and destroying one collectively that's great so you you took this really expensive paint it was it a painting it was, it was a it was a little bit of drawing a little bit of pastel a little okay. bit of it was a mishmash and then you passed uh plastered ads all over it for people who had bought ad space yeah yeah so i i uh, made a website and said if you want to buy an inch of this uh, painting is going to be worth a hundred dollars, uh, and I ended up selling all the ad space in a very quick time frame, which was amazing. Um, and uh, through that, I purchased the painting, and we printed the ads on top, and it is extremely colorful, extremely intense with all these different ads from varying different people. There's um, uh, 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 people's logos. There's mom and pop shops. There's uh, a couple. Um, uh, um, people's faces on it. It's just so crazy. Huh. Yeah. Now, did you, doing this project, did you actually break into the art world? Yeah, like, well, Did it was, you get into, like, one of those premium gallery houses or whatever it is? Yeah, oh, well, from that, I am part of the New Museum New Ink program, so I had reached out to um, a uh, some of the curators there, and basically we set up a uh, gala event where I was able to released the concept that we were going to auction off the painting for twice as much as it's worth. So the act of erasure was actually beneficial to the painting itself. So I increased its value by destroying it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I I did not want to do it in an auction house because I was trying to separate myself from doing okay. that, even though I was approached. Uh, it was a critique on the auction house. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um, uh, we basically did another media campaign where I ended up 
starting the bid at twenty thousand uh, dollars would sell the piece. So I got a, quite a few bids. Well, I got three legitimate bids, and the last bid was for twenty one thousand dollars and was sold. And it's now in the Schroeder Collection in London. Hmm. Uh, so it's wow. uh, legitimate. Um, Art world collector who owns Robert Rauschenberg's and Iowa Way pieces um, uh, in a very large collection uh, purchased it. So, on my scale, I'm like, yeah, this is successful. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Hmm. It's it's impressive to me the the reach that you've that you've had with your work and and I wonder if you have kind of like any recommendations for people who are who are doing work and and want to see about you know, getting in touch with these publications, like, you know, how do they go about beginning those relationships or, you know, if you have any advice? Uh, just, um, I tend to focus on the presentation of a lot of my projects mm. and it, it's to each his own. I think, um, the presentation is definitely more, uh, prone to getting an article in such and such newspaper. Uh, but they, um, it definitely helps. It definitely legitimizes your project and it might connect you to someone who you maybe have never talked to before yeah so but i think always keep on pushing it i had no idea what i was doing when i first started and i still don't know what i'm doing at all uh but that's the beauty of it so you have to keep on trying and keep on emailing and uh keep on meeting people and it's just a constant thing but it and end of the day it should work out yeah it sorry it's it's just so interesting to me because it's like you're gauging the validity of your work you know through it's it's almost as if like you know to think of it on the industrial designer side it's like going to investors with an idea and gauging gauging it that way it's just like you're doing it through the media which is is so fascinating to me it's like a it's it's a different approach from what i'm used to yeah and i also really like the point you made about the presentation like that's what you focus on yeah i've always been in the impression impression that like the actual presentation is like 95 percent of the project yeah i mean there is only like a very slim few amount of people are actually going to physically touch your product so having yeah. having like a presentation online is so important to have yeah. like good photos, good graphics, good everything. Yeah, is there anything that you see in presentation of of product work that you're like oh, if they just did this like is uh on a general scope I think um uh I purchased a a nice set of lights uh and they've been extremely useful the past 3 or 4 years and the quality of all my work just like skyrocketed just because mm. I got some good lights. <laughs> so at a very basic level, I was like, wow, this is amazing. So in my studio, I have a light setup, light studio space, and it's uh, make something, throw it in the light booth, take a really nice photo, and then get out and start doing the next thing. So yeah. that in its that has just been amazing. Yeah. yeah. I, I bought lights, 80 bucks on Amazon. Yeah. For two of them. It's been it, it's been beneficial. I mean, people just comment on on how ble- beautiful we are. And <laughs> it's uh, it's great. I love that. But yeah, I, I mean, is there anything about storytelling? You know? Oh yeah. Um. Uh. Yeah, not just lights. Um. The. Uh. I would test your the photos capability of telling a story. The video capabilities of telling a story with. Your uh, friends and family. I think uh, your audience is the public, and um, I am positive that your friends and family would give you great critiques on whatever you're trying to show people. Um, and it's it's all about telling a story that could be hard to digest or um, hard to um, get across in some way, but in a beautiful way. And you you can do that through objects, and um, it's. It's uh, It definitely takes some time, but there are ways to do that. Now, Nick, one more question. Do you have, like, what is the future of your studio? Are you, I mean, I know you said you have recently raced a robot and that's your next video, but what about, like, like do you see yourself still doing these conceptual products five years out? Or Yeah, that's a great question. So there, I do a lot of freelance, I do a lot of, like, uh, uh, client work, freelance work stuff. Like tr- um, traditional industrial design? Or? Um, definitely not. I've done uh, products from... I've uh, The most ridiculous stuff, I have done quite a few marijuana projects from the marijuana world mm. in California, and that's been very 
hilarious and amazing. Uh, I have some other traditional web clients that I do PR stuff in New York City, and that's uh, where I like spend 20% of my time throughout the day. Uh, these projects that are slow run uh, art pieces kind of are definitely um, more of uh, performances that I hope that would develop more into an art practice of some sort. They're definitely, like we started out with the podcast, they're on the side of are they art or are they design? Mm -hmm. Who's the audience if it's only art and not design and on the other side of that. Right. So um, I'm all like, I'm super happy of where I am right now, but I'm always trying to figure out how does this work in five years? Because I, I, there's a lot of running around that happens with making very quick designs continuously. Yeah, mm. yeah. Yeah, and what are you most excited about, like, going forward? Um, that is a great question. Um, I have a couple really fun projects, projects coming out, which I'm super pumped about. Um, uh, I am at the new museum for another year, so, uh, that's very exciting. It's just an amazing space with a ton of amazing people. Yeah. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I, we'll, we'll see. I, I will definitely keep you guys in touch with other crazy projects and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks so much again, Nick, for being on the podcast and sharing your knowledge. Is there like do you want to promote anything? Do you have anything to Do promote? I promote. Um, uh, I mean, the chalk. This, the yeah, chalk this, chalk, is... this chalk is great. I'll promote the podcast on the podcast. This podcast is great. <laughs> and these two are really fun. You can't promote the podcast. <laughs> They're already listening. Yeah. <laughs> if you got through this entire thing with me talking, then you should you deserve a pat on your back yourselves, listeners. <laughs> Well, definitely check out the chalk. You can buy it on your yes, website, yeah. right? You can buy it on the website. Uh, you could uh, all the museum stores in the city. A lot of the art ones have this at sale. Um, uh, yeah, my website is definitely the place to go, though. And, and what is your website? <laughs> uh, NicholasBentelStudio.com. And that's Nicholas with a K. Yes. Yeah. And in I. N I K O L A S. Yes. And then you're also on Instagram and YouTube. Yeah, yeah. So I mainly focus on Instagram, uh, and uh, I'm at at N I K B E N T L. Uh, definitely check me out. I do just very crazy performances as well on there, but on a smaller scale. The the naked the naked coffee table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's that's awesome, uh, and definitely check Nick out on on all of his platforms. We'll post on our website, right? Uh, Instagram and everything, um, and yeah, you guys can always like and subscribe on YouTube, what Spotify, Google. Oh, we Play, got that Spotify going now. Um, Apple Podcasts, the usual stuff, and and yeah, is that is that it? That's it. All right, and as always, I'm at Nick P Baker. I'm at I Draw and Receipts, and we'll see you later, guys.